see where Scott can look over here and see him. We're glad to welcome Scott again for our speaker, and we know that he'll enjoy himself and we'll enjoy him because he's always fun and full of all kinds of service, and he's a man of God. So let's open tonight with turning to page 204. Oh, how we love Jesus. Page 204 in the brown book. In the brown book.
social down in the basement. People can go down to that too and um, get some cookies or whatever they have. And then of course, Friday, on campfire starts at 8.45. And then uh, Friday we'll be going to Chuck E. Cheese instead of Saturday night. And we thought that would work out a lot better so we moved the schedule up with times and everything. Okay, does anybody else have any additional announcements or prayer requests? If anybody has a special for the youth program, please let me know so I can get it on the schedule. Okay. Anybody that has a special for the youth program on Saturday afternoon, make sure you let Tasha know or Chandra. Yes. Or Tasha. There's two or Tasha. little tables out there with the outdoor furniture. Do not sit on them. They will break. Okay. Okay. What? Just out here? Yeah, they're just two little tables. Okay. Yeah. And we do have one puzzle that we have to put up downstairs, and it's not as many pieces as usual, so like 800 some pieces, but the pieces are like just little. So it's not going to be real easy to put together, but it's the city of Jerusalem. Okay. So let's turn to page 363, and I know we're real familiar with this song too Jesus Saves.
conference more than two years ago. Uh, Nancy contacted me on behalf of the conference, and I said yes, and then of course, we all got introduced to COVID, and last year, or I mean two years ago, it was virtual, I guess last year was virtual, and uh, so it's nice to, either it's gotten better or we've gotten used to it enough that we feel uh, comfortable to meet together, and I'm thankful for that. I want to begin by telling you a little story, and we'll get around to applying it later. But Grandpa was visiting his daughter and her family, and uh, he was taking a nap on the couch. And his two little grandchildren got thinking, and they wanted to play a prank on Grandpa. And their mother, a while earlier, had bought some Limburger cheese. Maybe you're familiar with Limburger cheese? It's, uh, I think it tastes okay. I've never really tasted it kind of that close, but it smells awful. There's <laughs> a terrible odor with it. And so they went and got some of that Limburger cheese. And Grandpa was sleeping on the couch. Grandpa had a mustache, and they took it and just kind of spread it lightly on his mustache and ran away. <laughs> then they Next room started making enough noise so that Grandpa would wake up. So Grandpa got up and got off the couch. He goes, this room stinks. <laughs> he walked into the family room kitchen area and this whole house stinks. <laughs> Grandpa walked outside, great outdoors, and the whole world stinks. <laughs> Well, you ever felt like that? Like the whole world stinks. Everything is rotten. Nobody cares. Everything's against me. If you're old and remember the old TV show, Hee Haw, remember the guys used to say, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. You know, you feel that way. Like everything is against you. Nothing is coming together. We all get into those moods at times. We'll get back to that. The theme of the conference is Tabernacles of the True God. It's uh, been interesting preparing for the lessons. Uh, the focus of the lessons is to look at this elaborate tent. You have a model of it here that God delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai and the children of Israel constructed. And it has certain articles in it we'll be looking at in more detail. And it was to be the focus of the worship of the children of Israel. And we'll be looking at that in all the different classes and I think you'll find it interesting. But I thought for the evening messages we have just a little bit different focus. And I want to begin by focusing on just who are the children of Israel? Well, if you remember the story, Jacob had separated from his brother and grown a family of his own and decided to go back and try to be reconciled to his brother. And he was terrified because they had left on very unfriendly terms. And he sends his family and his wives across the river and he stays there by himself, and it says he wrestled with someone all night. Now, we're not sure if it was an angel. Whoever it was, Jacob saw it as a representative of God. And neither could prevail against the other. And Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. So eventually this being, probably an angel, blesses Jacob. And he says, what's your name? And Jacob says, Jacob. He says, well, no more. He says, we're going to change your name to Israel. So when we talk about the children of Israel, we're talking about the children of Jacob. The descendants of Jacob are the children of Israel. His dependents down through the ages. Well, Jacob was the son of Isaac, and Isaac was the son of Abraham, you know, Father Abraham, I thought maybe I should ask Nancy to sing it, but I was afraid she would ask me to come up and help. I'd be happy to do that. 
But Father Abraham, his descendants, are who the children of Israel are. God called out this one man, Abraham, he called Abram at that time, but his name was later changed to Abraham. And he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Look north, south, east, west, all you see, I will give it to you. And so it's those descendants of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob or Israel, that are the children of Israel. Jacob became, or Abraham became sort of the father of Judeo-Christian faith. Jewish people looked to Abraham, Christians looked to Abraham. Our particular group, we call ourselves in a lot of the churches, Church of God of the Abrahamic faith, believing those promises God made to Abraham applied to us through Jesus Christ. So you kind of look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you think, what were they like? What were their families like? You know, nowadays we hear a lot about dysfunctional families. Families that don't work very well. You know, there's problems between parents and children. It's just a mess. I mean, every family is a bit dysfunctional. I mean, doesn't every family have some kind of a crazy uncle or somebody in their family? I mean, if you're looking around and saying, I don't think we do in our family, well, you're probably a bit. <laughs> every family is a bit dysfunctional. But you look at the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, it just seems like they were a mess. You know, Father Abraham, God called and said, I want to make of you a great nation. Go out into a land that I will show you. Abraham left everything and followed God. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God, and God counted to him his righteousness. So because of his faith, God counted Abraham as righteous. But Abraham's family life was not that great. God had given Abram, or Abraham, a beautiful wife named Sarah. In fact, she was so beautiful that when Abraham would meet people, he was afraid they would kill him and take his wife. So great father Abraham, what does he do? He said, well, she's my sister. And in a way, I guess she was sort of his half-sister. But it wasn't exactly great courage, was it? Well, God had told Abraham and Sarah that they would have descendants. Eventually, as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sea and the sand on the sea. But unfortunately, Sarah was barren. She wasn't able to have children. And it was a heartbreaking thing. Barrenness is a difficult thing anytime. But for the Jewish people, it was especially difficult because that was kind of their badge of continuing. And so it was heartbreaking that Sarah didn't have children. So Sarah comes up with an idea to help God along. You know, we should serve God. We don't need to direct what God needs to do. God can handle it himself. But Sarah has this idea. She says, I got this slave named Hagar. Hagar, you go in and sleep with my husband and have a child. And that will fulfill this thing. Now, you don't have to be a family life specialist. to know that's not a good idea. I mean, this isn't going to work out. Hagar... Sleeps with Abraham. She becomes pregnant. She has a child. Takes an Ishmael. And things fall apart. Sarah resents it. She's jealous. She makes life miserable for Hagar. And eventually Hagar is sent away. And God spares her and brings her back. But after that it wasn't good. Hagar kind of bored it over Sarah. I can have children, you can. And you can just imagine the tension and the stress of that family. Well, then three men come alive, and we know now are angels. 
And they said, you're going to have your own child. Sarah's going to conceive. Sarah overhears it and she laughs. Are you crazy? By now, Abraham and Sarah were nearly 100 years old. Well past childbearing age. But God miraculously fulfilled the promise. And God gave them a child in their old age. And he dies it. Isaac found a wife through the help and providence of God named Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac had twins, Esau and Jacob. Sounds like an idyllic family life, right? No. You see, Isaac loved Esau. Esau grew up to be a man's man. He was a hunter, burly guy. He loved to go out and kill fresh grain, uh, game, fix it all up for his dad, and his dad loved it. Jacob, the other twin boy, and incidentally, they were not identical because they were paternal, because they didn't look alike. While Esau was big and burly, Jacob was more fair, probably thin, probably weaker looking. And Rebecca loved Jacob. So here you have twin boys. One is daddy boy, the other is mama boy. And you can imagine the tension between these two brothers was great. To make matters worse, Jacob was a bit of a manipulator. And Jacob manipulated and took away his brother's birthright. <clears throat> Esau isn't playing for that too. He didn't really value it. And then when it came time for Jacob and Esau to be blessed by their father, again they began to do some manipulation. And Rebecca helped with this. Isaac said to his son Esau, go out and kill something for me and make some of that good game and I'll bless you. So he goes out and goes hunting. Rebecca overhears all that and says, hey, I've got an idea. She takes a lamb or a kid, fixes it all up like it's wild game, seasons it that way, and says to her son, Jacob, go on in there to your dad, who by now is, is near the blind, and tell him that you're Esau, and he'll bless you. He said, well, I can't do that. But she disguises him, puts on garment like he saw war and put some hair on his arms and he goes in there and Isaac says, is that you? He saw him, yeah, yeah, it's me, he lied. And sure enough, Isaac blesses Jacob, the blessing intended for Esau. Well, about that time, Esau comes back and he realizes his brother has stolen his blessing. So now Jacob has stolen the blessing and the birthright from his brother. A few tensions in that family, right? You know how big the tensions were? Esau was going to murder his brother Jacob. Now, that's pretty dysfunctional when one sibling is planning to murder the other. And so Rebecca, knowing that Esau is going to murder his brother, his twin brother, she sends him away. And the pretense to go out there and find somebody to marry, to go back to our home area to do that. <clears throat> so Jacob goes, and sure enough, uh, he comes in and meets this girl. Her name was Rachel. And he loved her immediately. The Bible says she was beautiful and had a lovely form. Guys, he would say she was a baby. She was cute, good looking. And Jacob falls madly in love with Rachel. So he goes to his father, who is a relative, or goes to her father, and he says to her, I want to marry Rachel. Her father, which was kind of a scoundrel himself, says, Tell you what, you work for me for seven years, and I'll let you marry my daughter Rachel. It says the years flew by 
Jacob was so madly in love, so anxious to marry Rachel, that the seven years seemed like nothing. At last it came to be the wedding night. Jacob waits in his tent for his bride Rachel to come in. Now, in our day and age with the electricity everywhere, we don't hardly know what it's like to be dark. But there was no electricity. It was totally dark. And the lady comes into his tent. They embrace, have relations with one another. Dawn comes, the light appears. And you know what's happened? Laban has switched. Rachel's sister Leah with her. And Jacob ended up marrying Leah instead of Rachel. Now it says of Leah, she had weak eyes. That's our description of her. Rachel was beautiful with a lovely form. Leah had, Rachel, had weak eyes. Well, Jacob is enraged. He goes to his father and law says, what have you done? Well, this is our custom. We always marry the oldest off before we marry the youngest. You stay with Leah for one week, and then if you'll work another seven years, you can have Rachel too. And so that's what happens. And Jacob ends up marrying sisters. One that he loves, one that he feels he got stuck with. Now again, you don't have to be a family life specialist to say, that's not a good situation. That's not going to work out very well. These two sisters hate each other. Or at least they resent each other. And now they're both married to one guy, and he clearly loves one a lot more than he loves the other. You know, I don't know how Leah felt exactly, but it could have been very good. But they go along, and sure enough, Leah is expected and has a son, and again, and again, and again. And she gives uh, Jacob four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And Jacob is feeling good about his four sons. Leah is feeling good about the four sons. And who's feeling miserable? Rachel. Rachel, like her, like uh, Jacob's grandmother, Sarah, can have children. She's barren. And so here her sister has turned out four fine boys for their father, and she hasn't been able to give him a child. So Rachel has an idea. She says, I have this slave girl. You sleep with my slave girl and have children. And so Jacob does. In fact, he produces two children with Rachel's handmaid. Again, you don't have to be a genius to say, this isn't going to work out very well. There's resentment. So Leah says, well, you can play that game. And she takes her handmaid and has Jacob sleep with her. And Jacob has two children with her. So suddenly now, uh, we have eight children. And then Leah ends up having two more sons herself. So Jacob has now produced ten children, six with his wife Leah, two with Rachel's slave, two with Leah's slave, and Rachel, the woman he loves, is barren. And then God blesses them. And sure enough, Rachel has a baby. A little boy. And they named him Joseph. Tragically, a short time after that, Rachel had another baby, Benjamin, and she died in childbirth. So here is this son that has been produced by the wife that he really loves. Jacob has 12 sons. And you think, well, Jacob, do you remember what it was like when your father loved Esau more than he loved you? Do you remember how that made you feel that you were not loved by your father, that he had a favorite? Never crosses Jacob's mind, evidently. 
because he clearly has a favorite. Joseph is his favorite, and he makes no bones about it. I have 12 sons, but Joseph is my pride and joy. And the rest of you are okay then. Joseph, man, is he smart and intelligent and athletic and sharp. Wow. You know what else he does? He said, I want to get a special coat for Joseph to wear. So you will all know how special he is. Of course, Jacob's 11 brothers understood this, right? Of course not. They hated their brother. They hated it. There was intense sibling rivalry. So much so that they were intending to kill Joseph. So now you have two generations of families where the brothers are going to kill another brother. I would say that's a pretty dysfunctional family. Well, they catch Joseph by himself. And they're going to kill him. And then along come some traders, and they said, eh, instead of killing him, let's sell him into slavery and make some money on the deal. So they do that. And they take his special robe, they kill an animal, cover it with blood, tear it all up, and go back and tell him, we found this, is this Joseph's robe? And of course, Jacob knew it was. And we said, we think a wild animal wants to kill him. And Jacob is absolutely devastated. He has lost his son, his pride and joy, the love of his life, and he's crushed and in sorrow. To make matters worse, the family has more troubles. Reuben, Jacob's oldest son, decides to sleep with Rachel's handmaid slave, one of Jacob's wives. Not a good idea. Simon and Levi, uh, Simeon and Levi are angry because their sister was abused. But the guy that abused her says, I love her, I want to marry her. It's okay, well, if you and everybody in the village will be circumcised, we'll let you marry her. So they all, yeah, we'll do that. And they're all circumcised. And about the third day when they're all a lot of discomfort from the circumcision, Simeon and Nephi go in with knives and swords and kill all the men. Vicious people. Slaughtered and murdered a whole village. And then you have Judah, who lied to his daughter-in-law, who ends up dressing up like a prostitute, Judah goes to this prostitute, impregnates her, finds out it's his own daughter-in-law who's gotten pregnant, so he wants to kill her, and then she uh, discloses to him that you, Judah, are the father. And incidentally, that daughter-in-law is one of them in the line of Jesus. It's another sermon, another story. I, I share all that just to show you what a messed up family this was. I mean, it was worse than the soap operas on our TV today. Well, Jacob and his sons are experiencing a worldwide famine, and now among all their other problems, they have no food. Meanwhile, Joseph, the son sold into slavery, ends up down in Egypt. And he's bought by a man named Potiphar. And Joseph was an extremely bright young man. And Potiphar recognizes this, and before long, Joseph is the head of Potiphar's household. He's talented, skilled, and he makes him over all his household. Well, Potiphar's wife isn't such a good lady, and she tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph is righteous and refuses, so she falsely accuses him of rape, and Potiphar ends up throwing Joseph into prison. And he languishes in prison for a long time. There are two of the king's officials who end up in prison too. They both have dreams. They don't know what they mean. And God tells Joseph, you can interpret these dreams. And he tells them what they mean. And he was absolutely right. 
One of the men would be put to death, the other would be restored. The one who was restored said, well, I'll, I'll tell the king about you. He didn't. He forgot all about it. But later, the king has this dream. The pharaoh, he can't remember what it means. And he's asking for interpretation, and, and nobody can answer it. And then he says, hey, I remember this guy in prison. So they quick plead Joseph up, bring him before the pharaoh or the king, and the king gives him this dream, and Joseph interprets it perfectly. He says there's going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And if you prepare for it by saving a lot of food during the plenty years, we'll have enough food to get through the famine years. And he's so impressed with Joseph that he makes Joseph second in command to Egypt. And Joseph handles the years of plenty, stores up lots of food, and so when there's famine, uh, drowning throughout the world, Egypt has plenty of food. Meanwhile, back to Jacob and his other 11 sons. They're starving. And they hear there's food in Egypt. So, Jacob sends down his boys to Egypt. But he keeps back Benjamin, the only son of Rachel that he still has. And they go down there to buy food, and who do they have to buy it from? None other than their brother Joseph, who they have sold into slavery. But they don't know it's Joseph. He looks like an Egyptian. But Joseph immediately recognizes them. And it's fascinating reading. We don't have time to go into all the details. But they work out this thing. Joseph accuses them of, of lying. They say, no, we're not lying. We are uh, 11 sons of man, one one son is dead, the other the youngest boy is at home, and, and Joseph said, well, if that's really the truth, I'm going to hold one of you captive until you bring back your youngest son, and that'll prove to me you're telling the truth. So, they, uh, they do that, they don't have any choice, really, and they come back with plenty of food, and they tell their father what has happened. I want you to, uh, well, you can just listen, or if you want to turn in your Bible, uh, find the reference here. <laughs> Sorry about all that. I forgot to tell the story. I forgot to look at my notes, but we'll get to it here in a minute. Uh, it's found in Genesis 42, 36. They come and they tell their dad, We've got to bring Benjamin down there to prove that our story is true. If not, he's going to keep our brother, who I believe was Simeon, in prison. Uh, what are we going to do? So he tells them this. They tell him this. And here's Jacob's response. This is Genesis 42, 36. Their father Jacob said to them, You have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. You hear, Jacob? Everything is against me. The whole world stinks. Nothing is working out right. Everything I try gets messed up. Nobody cares what I care. It's awful. Joseph is no more, he's been killed. Simeon's locked up in a prison in Egypt, and you want to take Benjamin too? You're crazy. And for a long time, Jacob wouldn't let Benjamin go. Finally, they got desperate and needed food, and they send uh, Benjamin down with the others. But you know, you think of Jacob at that moment. He just felt the world stinks. Everything is against me. Nothing is good. Life is miserable. Everybody hates me. Nobody likes me. Think I'll eat some worms. You know, a little children's day. What Jacob didn't realize is he was on the threshold of maybe the greatest blessing of his life. 
because they do send Benjamin down there. And once more they appear before Joseph, not knowing it's Joseph. And there they actually reach a point of repentance. And they confess to this stranger, who they, isn't a stranger, it's his brother, that they had sinned and done wrong. And that's what Joseph wanted to hear. And Joseph then sends everybody out and he says, Guys, I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. And they're shocked. And at first they're terrified, but they realize Joseph isn't going to kill them, and they embrace. What a magical, beautiful scene that must have been. We talked about forgiveness. Joseph forgave them. He forgave them for what they had done to him. He says at one point, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so they go back to their dad and say, Dad, you're not going to believe this, but Joseph is alive. I don't, I don't know if anything harder that I've had to deal with as a pastor than to dealing with the death of a child. You know, we're kind of geared to maybe lose our parents, maybe even lose our spouses, but so when we lose a child, that's devastating. Joseph was dead, Jacob thought. He thought he had lost his child, but now he's been reconciled to him. That'd be one of the happiest days, if not the happiest day of Jacob's life. And they all go down to Egypt. And there they live a really good life. Joseph is is the most second most powerful person in Egypt. He sets them up in a beautiful area. They're able to live their life. They had been starving. Now they have plenty of food. And life is good. These brothers are reconciled. Maybe they've learned what life is all about. And things are good. There's two lessons that I'd like us to take away from this story. First is God can work through dysfunctional families and through dysfunctional people. There will be no pain, or there will be pain, I mean, because of dysfunction. Don't, don't get it wrong. If you are part of a dysfunctional family, it's painful at times. But that does not mean, and that pain cannot thwart God accomplishing his purpose. In a lot of ways, Abraham's family was a mess. In a lot of ways, Isaac's family was a mess. In a lot, a lot of ways, Jacob's family was a mess. But God worked through them to accomplish his will and his purpose. The Bible speaks of sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. God can do anything, including working through dysfunctional families. Don't despair if your family life wasn't all you wanted it to be. If your parents weren't perfect. Let me tell you something, there are no perfect parents. That God can do amazing things. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask of things. One of the best pastors that I've ever known, a dear friend of mine, grew up in a totally dysfunctional family. He saw things that just, he shared with me that just make you cringe that any little boy had to go through that. But God can work through it. God is greater than our dysfunction, greater than our challenges, greater than our problems. God can do amazing things. Second lesson I want you to gain from that story is when everything seems to be a mess. When you feel like everything is against me, like Jacob said. When it seems like the whole world stinks, like Grandpa said. Don't despair. God is able to work things out. A number of years ago, I was talking with a woman 
Christian woman who was estranged from her daughter. She was absolutely brokenhearted. Her daughter had refused to talk to her. It was over a spiritual matter, but they just disagreed so sharply that they broke it off communications, and she lost communication with her grandchildren, and she was absolutely devastated. And she was sharing with me her pain, and I was trying to be empathetic and understanding, and God just seemed to nudge me, and I said to her, just remember the last chapter of your life has not been written. And that registered with her. And I'm glad to say it took maybe a year and a half, but they reconciled. And her and her daughter patched things up, and they reached an understanding. And it was good because the woman then had cancer and has died. But I guess I want us to remember the last chapter of your life hasn't been written. Things might be hard, they may be difficult, but it's not over. And it may not be until the kingdom of God where it's all worked out. But God's not finished with you yet. Jacob thought everything was awful. Everything is against me. I don't see any reason to keep on living. But he was on the threshold of finding out his son he thought was dead was alive. Finding out his family that he thought was starving would have plenty of food. Finding out his brothers that didn't get his sons that didn't get along with their brothers were about to be reconciled. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Never doubt the amazing power of God. Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, they had their problems. They were messed up in a lot of ways. But they're still the fathers of our faith, and we can learn from them and take heart. Whether the lesson is we're going to do better, or we're going to work through the problems that we have, God is able.
scriptures give us. Help us to be more Christ-like in all of our actions. But Father, I thank you of your compassion and your understanding and love. And that you can work even through the things we mess up to accomplish your will and purpose. Dismiss us now with your blessings. Help us to rest good this evening and be with us in this coming few days as we study your word. That we'll all grow and gain things that will help us to be more like your son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.